I wanted to go ahead and make a video on a subject that I have alluded to in some videos that I've already made. So this one is going to wind up being posted a little bit out of order, but the reason for that is earlier I had done a uh, video on is Banggood better than Amazon, and the subject of that video was this meter, which I had ordered through Amazon and which took about a week more than the latest delivery date that Amazon had promised. So uh, it has now arrived and I wanted to uh, show you the meter and in part I wanted to talk about this meter as well as the one next to it. But the real purpose of this uh, video is to talk about testing capacitors for tube circuits. This box of uh, old wax paper capacitors are some of the capacitors I have removed from vintage tube equipment over the last few years. Uh, I actually have an even bigger box than this that uh, I picked some just as a representative sample. And one of the reasons that I uh, picked these, this particular group is most of these are these wax paper, and they're obviously wax paper from the from the visible outside, but some of them like this, although they look like they are more modern plastic capacitors, they're really not. They're just wax paper capacitors wrapped in a plastic uh, or molded in a plastic. And people even used, well, I think uh, misleading names like one company called their their wax paper capacitors that had a molded plastic outside mica mold implying that there was mica in them because that's a better insulator and there there was no mica in them that was just a name so back to these meters these are mega ohm meters the one on the left is the BM500A the one on the right is the VC60B plus uh, I bought both of these meters from Amazon. This one from a supplier, I think it was from Amazon, and so of course it came right away, as do most of their U.S. shipments. But this I bought from an Amazon third-party uh, supplier who promised a delivery in 15 to 20 days, and it took, uh, well, uh, uh, right at 30 to get here. So. Uh, about 10 days later than their latest promise date. Uh, but nonetheless, one reason I wanted to wait for this meter to arrive before doing this video is one of the big differences between these two meters is this BM500 measures up to 2000 mega ohms, but it will do it at three different voltages, 250, 500, and 1000. And by the way, the way this uh, uh, selector is arranged. If you turn to the right, you go from 250 to 500 to 1000 and then off again. If you turn to the left, you start at 1000, 500, 250, and then off again. I presume that is intended to be a, uh, uh, a safety feature so that uh, you can always start at the lowest voltage no matter which off position you're in. Uh, this particular meter, I think, is, well, I don't know. It does not say on it that it, whether it is cat rated or not. The, uh, this uh, 600 or 60B does say it is rated for cat to 600 volts, but obviously you don't want to use these meters on uh, service wiring, that is the electric service that comes in from the street, because you need a CAT4 meter for that. So everything I'm going to be using these for is inside an electronics lab, and in, in every case, the uh, there won't be any water, there won't be any uh, high humidity, there won't be a lot of metal cases to worry about, and so on. At any rate, so the differences between these is this one will measure up to 2,000 mega ohms at 250, 500, or 1,000 volts. This one will only measure 
Well, it'll measure up to 200 megohms at 250 and 500, but to go to 2,000 megohms, you have to use 1,000 volts. However, this meter has multimeter functions that allow you to, to read uh, 750 and 1,000 volts and up to 200, uh, I think it's 2,000 ohms as, a, uh, as an ohm meter. But to do that, you have to move the probes. So uh, that is what I've been uh, playing with today. And I have a set of capacitors that are back here, labeled 2 through 6, that I have picked as representative. What I have done is I have tested those capacitors on both this BM500, uh, the VC60B, as well as the DIY capacitor tester that appeared in some of my earlier videos uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, as well as the Sencor LC102. So let me show you the results that I got. So here are capacitors number two through six, and by the way, Capacitor number one was this one, which I will talk about in a little bit. Uh, their capacity, is, I chose deliberately 0.1 and 0.05 because those tend to be two of the most popular sizes you find in vintage tube equipment. Uh, and I chose some at 400 volts and some at 600 volts. The LC-102, which I consider more or less my standard for uh, capacitor testing, showed these readings for the uh, leakage resistance of these capacitors. And this is all in megohms. So 1.3 megohms for the first, for capacitor number two. Capacitor number three is an, uh, shows overload and Capacitor number three is actually a pretty nice uh, 0.05 microfarad 600 volt capacitor. It is out of a piece of vintage equipment. You can still see some of the solder on the end there. But it was a fairly well-made capacitor and it came out of a nice Holocrafter's receiver, which uh, that is a point you probably should remember is when working on vintage equipment, if you have good capacitors in there to begin with, even if it's 50 years old, they may still be good. So you might want to just test them, and if they're still test good, leave them in. The reason is, I'll show you in a minute, you can actually introduce more problems by trying to replace all the capacitors. And, and that is some people's solution, is well, just replace them all. If you're real careful and you use really good quality tested capacitors to replace them, then I agree with them. It's a good idea. But if you're a little sloppy in your technique, you can wind up breaking things or leaving intermittence in the circuit. Or worse yet, if you put untested capacitors in, you can actually make things worse. So uh, part of the purpose of this video is to talk about why you want to test capacitors before you put them into tube equipment. So that's the LC-102. This is the uh, DE-5000, which is an, a very nice LCR meter, and what this shows is, is the dissipation. Uh, the dissipation is a measure of how much energy is wasted inside a capacitor, and maybe it's a good time to talk about that. A capacitor stores charge in a dielectric so kind of like this, when you apply a charge to a dielectric, that is you have metal plates on both sides and when you put electrons on one plate, it twists the dielectric and that's where the charge is stored. Then the, uh, as you, if you provide a current path for those electrons to flow out of the capacitor, the dielectric will untwist and it's the untwisting that drives the electrons back out of the capacitor. So it's important when you think of a capacitor, you think of a passive device that never moves. But remember, every time it is charged, it twists, and then it uncharges, and then it charges again, and discharges, and so on. So it's important to realize that. 
So this is the DE5000 and the dissipation, which is related to the leakage resistance. This is the DIY tester that I built, the little neon bulb tester that uh, was built to test capacitors in tube circuits. And this is the B means bad, the G means good. So it rated this one that tested on the LC102 to have very high leakage resistance and very low dissipation on the DE5000 as a good capacitor and all the rest is bad. Then the BM500, that's this meter, showed 1.2 ohms, uh, mega ohms, for leakage. Remember over here on the LC it was 1.3, so very close. Overload, which means uh, too high to measure, which is the same as the LC102. 3 mega ohms for capacitor 4 compared to 3.5, 3.7 compared to 3.7, and 1.8 compared to 1.99. Similarly, the VC60B Plus measured 1.4, 3.2, 4.4, uh, and 1.9. Now, I should point out that all of these were tested at 250 volts, well within their voltage rating. So, I said that capacitor number one was actually this one. And so I'd like to turn now to the question of why should you test capacitors at all? After all, if you could test them in circuit and replace the bad ones, that's a good reason to own a tester. But suppose you're going to replace them all anyway. Do you need to test the capacitors that you put in in their place? My answer is yes. And the reason is, these are two brand new capacitors. They came in the same batch from the same supplier. They are exactly the same value. They are 630 volt film capacitors. And the bottom one tests bad. In fact, when I first put it on the DIY tester, a little curl of smoke came out of a spot in the, and I don't know if you can see this, but right there is a little imperfection where the capacitor got hot and actually blew a little hole in the plastic. This capacitor came from the same batch, it tests good. But this capacitor would probably have tested good on something like the DE5000 or any of those LCR meters that measure ESR until enough high voltage was put on it to stress the insulation and cause it to overheat. And it was only then that it failed. You don't want that to happen in your radios. So. If you're working with tube circuits, it's my view that you should have a capacitor tester of some kind and one that tests at voltage. Because in a tube circuit, one of the things that causes the capacitor to fail is the high voltage. Now it's okay to test at low voltage and throw away the ones that are bad, but if you're gonna put it in a tube circuit, I recommend you test the capacitor at high voltage. Now. Let me give you a very short introduction to my way of replacing capacitors, and, uh, or at least two ways, and then we'll uh, close this video. Now, when you're replacing a capacitor in a tube circuit, this is an octal socket, and I've attached the capacitor to one of the terminals in the traditional or vintage way where the, the lead goes through the, the uh, pin on the tube socket and then loops around and is, is crimped back. So it basically makes a U like this that is then crimped in around the, the tube socket, if you think of this as the tube socket. When you're replacing capacitors that are mounted like this, the one thing you do not want to do is break off that pin in the tube socket. Now some 
tube sockets, you can replace the pin fairly easily, but it's a real mess. But some of them, the only way to fix it is to replace the whole socket, which you do not want to do. Further, you don't want to leave an intermittent connection here. So, generally people use two methods, both of which are fairly reliable. One method is to cut off this capacitor back some distance, like here, leaving a pigtail, and then to wind a the new capacitor into a little circle, slide it over, and crimp it on this wire that's sticking out. That is one way to do it. Another way is to try to remove the uh, wire from the socket, take the, the solder off with some solder wick or something, or a solder uh, bolt or something of that sort. I recommend you not try to do that. Instead, what I recommend you do is Cut the capacitor right up at the tube socket so you're not putting any strain on the pin of the tube socket. Then, after you have cut the capacitor off, cut this little tab off. It'll be buried in solder, but go ahead and cut the little tab off. So that, in essence, if you think about it, what you've done is you've cut this off so that this is still sticking through the socket, and then you cut this little tab off so that it's no longer crimped. This then, when you unsolder it, will fall away, and this little piece will just be a small piece of wire sticking through the tube socket that you can easily pull out with a pair of long nose pliers without putting any stress on the tube socket itself. So I suggest that if you're going to replace the capacitors in an old in a vintage piece of equipment, uh, that you think about the process you're going to use and try to do it in a way that uh, minimizes the strain on the pins in the original equipment. Back in the day, tools like this were used to try to grab a hold of that little that little. Uh, end of the wire and twist it away from the, the tube socket. Back in the day that worked, but back in the day the metal had not sat around for 50 or 60 or 80 years getting hard and brittle. Today most vintage equipment and even some stuff built recently with cheap tube sockets, if you try to mess with this with very much force you wind up creating a real mess. Now, if you decide to use the pigtail method, I suggest you very carefully crimp and you make sure when you heat it that you don't just heat the, the curly cue, that you also heat the original wire so that there's solder down inside between the curly cue and the wire attached to the tube socket. Otherwise, what you'll wind up with is an intermittent. It'll look good from the outside, but there's no solder between the, the what I will call the sleeve and the actual connection wire. So, enough preaching. I hope that at least some of you <laughs> see some, some value in some of these tips, but these are some of the ways that I do it, and I have found over the years that this is the most reliable way of replacing capacitors, and of course, I always make sure that I test the capacitor that I'm putting in the circuit, because if you don't, what you can wind up with is a worse problem than the one you started with. Once again, I'm going to put this, uh, I'm going to post this a little bit out of order, but I'm doing it partly so that I can uh, point out that I now have received the meter from the Chinese Amazon supplier and that it does work and it seems to work fairly well. Uh, so, uh, so that chapter is closed and I hope that we'll open some new chapters in the future. In the meantime, stay safe, have a nice day.